In January 1899, a group of 16-year-old school students in the German city of Bremen won a tug-of-war competition. In recognition of their success, they received the tournament's grand prize, a football. Football had been played in Germany for at least 25 years by that point, but its popularity had only been growing steadily, and Germany still didn't have an official football association or national championship. Having won this football though, the young students decided that they should start their own football team. And thus, on February 4th, 1899, Werder Bremen was born. Over the next few decades, Werder Bremen became not just trailblazers, but also one of the most popular clubs throughout what was then the German Empire. Bremen were the first German football team to fence off their pitch and charge fans an admission fee to attend games, something that they were able to do due to their popularity. They were the first German club to employ a professional full-time head coach, and much later on, they also became the first German team to sign a footballer from Africa. Four-time champions of German football and six-time DFB Pokal winners, Bayern Munich and Borussia Dortmund are the only two German teams to have won more trophies than Bremen. Inaugural members of the Bundesliga in 1963, Bremen had only spent one season outside of the top flight of German football up to 2021, meaning that prior to this season, Bayern Munich were the only team to have competed in as many Bundesliga seasons as Bremen. No team has played more Bundesliga games than the Green Whites, who occupy third place in the all-time Bundesliga table, and won only the third double in the history of German football as recently as the 2003-04 season. And yet, in the 2020-21 season, Werder Bremen were relegated for only the second time in their history, and for the first time in more than 40 years. They follow a whole raft of Bundesliga giants to have suffered a similar fate in recent years, including their bitter rivals Hamburg, in a derby that will be reignited this season, but for the first time ever, as a second-tier fixture. In England, where I live, we often like to sing the praises of the championship. The combination of minnows and fallen giants, the different strategies, budgets, styles of play in stadiums, the number of games, the tempo of those games, and the tendency that the league has to throw up unexpected results. All of these factors have led some to crown English football's second tier as the best league in the world. But if you head east, 200 miles or so away, across the North Sea, you'll find a league doing its best to put even the championship to shame when it comes to once great fallen giants and unpredictable results. The 2021-22 second Bundesliga will be contested by the likes of Schalke, Werder Bremen, Hamburg, Hanover, Fortuna Dusseldorf and Nuremberg. The average stadium capacity in the division is over 31,000, compared to less than 25,000 in the championship. If you take out Bayern and Dortmund, the next four most decorated teams in the entire history of German football all compete in the nation's second division. It is a quite staggering fact, and today's video is all about one of the most staggering rises and falls within the German game. So sit back, relax, and join me on a journey to Bremen, one of Germany's poorest cities, but also one of the most passionate about football. In a region ravaged by the destruction of shipyards and heavy industry, and now in danger of losing their most beloved pastime. In a tale containing dodgy dealings, inspired signings, underhand tactics, managerial genius, love, loyalty, madness, injuries, debt, destruction trophies, and relegation all with a unique green-white tinge. As I said during the introduction, Werder Bremen were founded by a group of 16-year-old students, but the club very quickly grew in popularity. Seven months after the club was founded, they played their first game against ASC Bremen, who had been founded a whole year before them, but Werder won 1-0. Despite being such a young club, in 1900, Werder were represented at the founding meeting of the DFB, the German Football Association. Though Bremen's popularity allowed the club to charge spectators to attend games, it was after the Nazis came to power and reorganised German football into 16 regional top flights, all competing to make a national championship, that they really began to taste success. During those 12 years of the newly declared German Reich, Werder won four Gauliga Niedersachsen titles, competing often with their biggest rivals Hamburg for the regional crown. Despite those successes, Bremen never won a national championship, which were dominated by the likes of Schalke, Nuremberg and Dresden during those days. 
When the Bundesliga was founded in 1963, Werder became inaugural members, thanks to a second place finish in their regional Oberliga the previous season. A 10th place finish was considered rather disappointing in that debut campaign for Werder, four places behind their rivals Hamburg, but the following year, they won only the second Bundesliga season to be crowned as German champions for the first time. In 1971, Werder were at the epicentre of something of a scandal within German football, when a game against Borussia Mönchengladbach had to be called off after Gladbach forward Herbert Laumann fell into the goal, snapping the goalpost and bringing the whole net down. Because this had happened at Borussia Mönchengladbach's home ground, Werder were awarded a 2-0 win, and subsequently, all Bundesliga teams replaced their wooden goalposts with aluminium ones. In the 1974-75 campaign, Bremen came within one point of suffering their first Bundesliga relegation, and they decided that drastic action was required. Over the next few years, Werder Bremen became the biggest spending club in German football, investing hundreds of thousands of pounds in players that they hoped would drag them up the league table and into title contention, and earning them the derogatory nickname Millionelf or Million Squad within Germany. One of those new signings was England international Dave Watson, who arrived from Manchester City for more than £200,000. Watson was sent off in only his second game for the Green Whites for pushing 1860 Munich midfielder Hermann Bitz, and he was handed an eight-game ban by the German FA and suspended by Bremen. Watson subsequently refused to turn up to games after the ban came to an end and swiftly returned to England after just two games for the club. Whilst this was a particularly disastrous example, it is also rather indicative of how Bremen's big money signings worked out. Ultimately, the player that the club really wanted, Gunter Netzer, turned them down, and in 1980, the Million squad suffered the first relegation in the history of Werder Bremen. It came as a crushing blow, but it was also an opportunity to rethink, regroup, and come up with a more sensible long-term strategy and build for the future. New boss Kuno Klotzer did an excellent job of clearing out the deadwood and rebuilding Bremen, but midway through the 1980-81 second Bundesliga season, he was seriously injured in a car accident and had to resign. He was replaced by Otto Rehagel, who had already briefly managed Bremen in 1976, but would stick around for a little longer this time around. Rehagel was able to maintain Werder's spot at the top of the second Bundesliga table all season, and the club returned to the Bundesliga at the first attempt as champions. During this time, Werder also had a controversial, outspoken, and sometimes rather racist chief executive, or sporting director, as we might call them now, named Hans Wolf. An unusual character, who is alleged to have been involved in more than a few dodgy business practices, Wolf came out with some strange comments at times, and had taken a bit of a scattergun approach to the transfer market before A. Hagel arrived. It is said that Wolf would use methods as varied as bribery and intimidation in order to sign players, so you can see why he divided opinion. He was an excellent negotiator though, and under Ray Hagel, Werder pulled off some incredible deals within the transfer market. Together, they signed the likes of Rudi Voller, Rune Bratzef, and Karl-Heinz Riedler and Bremen began to assert themselves once again among the top table of German football. For the next eight seasons, yes, you heard that right, eight seasons, Werder Bremen never finished outside of the top five in the Bundesliga, qualifying to play in Europe every season and winning their first Bundesliga title in more than 20 years in 1988. In the 1989-90 season, Bremen defeated the reigning UEFA Cup champions Napoli, containing the world's best player Diego Maradona 8-3 on aggregate, in what was a stunning comeback, with the Germans having lost the first leg 3-2. This was a real golden era in Bremen, and they won the DFB Pokal in 1991, the European Cup Winners' Cup in 1992, the Bundesliga in 93, another Pokal in 94, and their third DFB Pokal of the decade in 1999. Otto Rehagel's extraordinary reign as Werder Bremen boss had come to an end in 1995, when he took the Bayern Munich job, and after 14 years playing under just one man, Bremen went through four managers in four years, before settling down with club legend Thomas Schaaf in the top job. Though he was born in Mannheim, around 300 miles away, Schaaf's heart very much belongs in Bremen. He joined the club in 1972 as an 11-year-old child, and since then, he has spent less than two years away from the club, whether that be as a player, manager, or administrator. 
In total, Sharp has spent almost 50 years working for the club in one capacity or another. So, there was particular sadness at the fact that he was the man stood in the dugout as Verdar's first relegation in 40 years was confirmed last season, but more on that in just a moment. Scharf's reign began with a signing that would be as important to him as Vola was to Rehagel, as Claudio Pizarro was signed from Alianza Lima in Peru for less than £2 million. Just like Vola, Pizarro departed before the real success began. But also like Voller, he earned the club a tidy profit that was wisely reinvested when he did so. Pizarro scored 38 goals in 76 games for Verdar before joining Bayern Munich for around £7 million. Three years later, when Bremen won the League and Cup double in 2004, Brazilian centre forward Ailton, who never won a cap for Brazil, scored 34 goals in 43 games. Verdar finished six points clear of Bayern Munich in a convincing Bundesliga title win, and they overcame second Bundesliga side Aluminia Aachen by three goals to two in an epic DFB Pokal final. Over the next six seasons, Verdar were Champions League regulars, only missing out on a top three finish on one occasion. Throughout this time, the club became renowned for their savvy work in the transfer market, bringing the likes of Miroslav Klose, Torsten Frings, Naldo, Diego, Per Mertesacker, and Mesut Ozil for bargain prices, often selling them on for huge profit. At both the 2006 World Cup that Germany hosted and at the 2010 World Cup in South Africa, Bayern Munich were the only team with more players in the Germany squad than Werder Bremen, a testament to the fine work that the club had done. And in 2008-09, following Claudio Pizarro's return to the Visa Stadion, he scored 28 goals as the Green Whites won the DFB Pokal. However, as we so often see in every top league, there is only so long that a club can keep selling their best players and replacing them with players of equal or even greater talent. For Verdar, that breaking point arrived at the start of the 2010s, though it was at least partially self-inflicted. In 2009, the club sold attack midfielder Diego to Juventus for £24 million, and the following summer, fellow number 10 Mesut Ozil followed him out the door, joining Real Madrid for £16 million. To replace them, Bremen brought in the likes of Marco Marin from Borussia Mönchengladbach, Wesley from Santos, and Marco Anautovic from FC Twente. Three talented but somewhat troubled footballers who struggled to gel at the Visa Stadium. Marin had an impressive season alongside Ozil, but once Ozil departed, he looked totally lost in the Verdar midfield. Wesley and Arnautovic became serious problems for the club, not just because they failed to produce on the pitch, but because of the controversy that they courted off it. Poor recruitment and poor characters quickly became a theme of the club's transfer dealings. In the 2010-11 season, Verdar slipped from 3rd place to 13th, their joint worst league finish since getting relegated in the 1980s. In the summer of 2011, Verdar had the choice of signing either Mehmet Ekcher or Ilkay Gundogan in midfield from Nuremberg for the same price. They chose to sign Ekcher, but whilst his star burnt out in Bremen, Gundogan's would go on to burn brighter and brighter at Borussia Dortmund. It was these kinds of poor decisions that the club had got spot on for so much of the previous decade that really began to undermine them. In many respects, though, it was the following summer of 2012 that really signalled the beginning of the end for the club as one that competed at the highest level. Following the loss of several key players in recent years, that summer, Verdar let goalkeeper Tim Weiser depart without putting up much of a fight, focusing all of their efforts instead on keeping veteran centre-forward Claudio Pizarro at the club. Weiser departed for Hoffenheim on a free transfer, meanwhile Pizarro ended up turning the club down and returned to Bayern Munich, also free of charge. Not only had Bremen lost two first-team stalwarts and two of their most talented players, they also lost two leaders within their dressing room, something that they could scarcely afford to have done, having lost Per Mertesacker the previous summer. In their place, Verdar signed Eliero Alea, another disruptive character who Bremen hoped to tame, but who ended up causing them more problems than he addressed. Having finished 9th in the 2011-12 campaign, Verdar were extremely fortunate to survive relegation the following season, after that woeful transfer window. They finished just three points above the relegation playoffs and only four points above certain relegation. And were it not for the presence of Kevin De Bruyne, who scored nine goals and made ten assists on loan from Chelsea that season, Verdar would certainly have been relegated. 
The club had effectively replaced lots of very good players with lots of mediocre ones, and had failed to replace any of the real leaders and good eggs within their dressing room, so they could have few complaints about their performances and results reflecting that fact. What's more, Bremen maintained a Champions League wage bill despite not having actually competed in the Champions League for a number of years, no longer having any Champions League or even Europa League revenue, and having a squad who looked nowhere near capable of qualifying for either European competition. One of Verdar's solutions to this worsening financial situation was to emulate the likes of Juventus and Chelsea in signing up a large number of young players who the club felt had the potential to make it within the professional game, then sending a whole raft of them out on loan in the hope that they could then sell them on for a profit or incorporate them into their first team. This was a project that had begun right at the beginning of the 2010s, but it intensified as the decade wore on. Verdar didn't quite have the budget of a Chelsea or Juventus though, which meant less extensive scouting, less lucrative recruitment, and fewer opportunities for those players when they went out on loan. In the end, Verdar basically ended up farming out thoroughly mediocre young players who almost never made more than a handful of first team appearances for them and tended to leave the club for nothing. The operation wasn't particularly capital intensive and it isn't responsible for Bremen's current dire financial situation, but it did take up some resources, no doubt plenty of time, and with virtually no positive results. Having only narrowly avoided relegation in 2013, Thomas Schaaf stepped down after 14 mostly wonderfully successful years managing Werder Bremen, which is the exact same number of years Otto Rehagel spent managing the club. To address their worsening financial situation, former Gladbach defender Thomas Eichen was brought in as Werder's new general manager, though crisis manager might have been a better title for his job. Eichen had never held such a position at a football club before, but he joined Bremen having just guided Cologne-based ice hockey team Kolne High from economic ruin to runners-up in Germany's National Ice Hockey League. Eichen did some valuable work when it came to balancing Bremen's books, but little to address the club's on-field struggles. One of the key problems at Bremen is the lack of consistent talent that is being produced within the club's youth ranks. If you are to succeed in the Bundesliga with a moderate budget, you need either a phenomenal recruitment policy or an academy that can repeatedly churn out talent. Werder Bremen's youth infrastructure is no longer fit for purpose, but nor can the club afford to update it. Plans have been drawn up for a new academy centre, but a lack of funds, along with flood risks at the current site, which seem all the more relevant right now given the awful recent flooding in Germany, have prevented the club from breaking ground, and at the moment, those plans look a million miles away from actually happening. Eichen hired two head coaches during his three years as general manager in Bremen, the first being Robin Dutt. A tactician who loves to tinker and outsmart his opposite number, Dutt isn't renowned for his man management skills, and his tactics never quite clicked at the Visa Stadion. When he was replaced, and indeed, when each of Werder Bremen's last three managers were replaced, they have been replaced from within. Dutt was replaced by Viktor Skripnik, Skripnik by Alexander Nori, and Nori by Florian Kofeld. All three were previously employed by Werder as players, and all three were previously employed by the club as coaches before becoming head coach. That is not to say that they were all like-for-like -like replacements, all three had their own tactics and ideas, but it did raise some questions about whether the club had become too insular, and whether they needed a fresh perspective from someone who hadn't been involved in the club, and a part of their demise, for quite such a long period of time. These questions were intensified when Thomas Eichen left in 2016, replaced with another internal appointment in the form of Frank Bauman. Bauman is a club legend at Werder, or at least he was as a player, where he made over 350 appearances, and he won more than 25 caps for the German national team. But his work as sporting director hasn't been to everyone's liking. His reign hasn't been all doom and gloom though. In the 2018-19 season, it appeared to some as though the club may have turned a corner. Having amassed 53 points in the Bundesliga, Werder would have qualified for the Europa League in 8 out of the last 9 seasons. But on this occasion, they finished just 1 point off in 8th place behind Eintracht Frankfurt. Nonetheless, spirits were duly raised, and there were hopes that the 2019-20 campaign could finally see a return to European football for Werder in the first time for almost a decade. 
There was shock then, both within and outside of the club, when Verdar spent almost the entire season mired in a relegation scrap. An emphatic 6-1 win against Cologne on the final day of the season ensured that the club wouldn't be automatically relegated. And in the promotion-relegation playoffs, Verdar survived by virtue solely of away goals in a dramatic game against Heidenheim. In truth, Verdar's struggles perhaps shouldn't have come as such a great surprise. Having lost Max Cruz to Fenerbahce on a free transfer, they were devoid of goals and creativity, relying heavily on young Kosovan international Mila Rosicka. Bremen had also brought in two highly paid, highly injury prone and aging players with very little sell on value in the forms of Nikolit Fulkrug and Leonardo Bittencourt. Meanwhile, Loni Davy Selka couldn't hit a cow's ass with a banjo. All it took was a dreadful injury crisis and Verdar quickly turned into relegation fodder. The reason the club's transfer business had become so dubious was because talented chief scout Tim Steiten, who was responsible for signings like Thomas Delaney, Ludwig Augustinsson and Serge Gnabry, had been poached by Bayer Leverkusen, with the promise of a bigger budget. He too was replaced from within, and Bremen's new strategy was to sign more established Bundesliga players, meaning less hidden gems, less value for money, less sell on value, and, in their case at least, a handful of players who struggled to stay fit for more than five games in a row. Baumann stood by Florian Kofalt at the start of the season just gone, and Verdar got off to a decent start, losing only one of their opening eight league games, albeit they only won two. It was imperative that the club got off to a strong start, since their end to the season always looked to be brutal. They continued to grind out points as the season wore on though, and ahead of their difficult run-in, with just 9 games to go, Bremen had a 10-point cushion above the relegation zone. It looked as though one win from those 9 games would keep the club in the Bundesliga, but Verdar couldn't even manage that. As Bremen faltered, those teams around them, specifically Cologne and Armenia Bielfeld, went on excellent runs of form. In Verdar's penultimate game of the season, and seemingly one of their most winnable fixtures against Augsburg, Augsburg had a player sent off after just 9 minutes. This was Bremen's big opportunity, but in the 49th minute, with the game still tied at 0-0, Christian Gross was sent off for Verdar, and they went on to lose the game 2-0. Kofeld departed following that defeat, with club legend Thomas Schaaf returning on an interim basis for the final game of the season. Werder Bremen were beaten 4-2 by Borussia Mönchengladbach, and their fate was sealed. With just six minutes to go, it still looked as though the club could go into the relegation playoffs instead, but events elsewhere prevented them from getting that opportunity. When you take just one point from your last nine games, you cannot have too many complaints when such fortune doesn't favour you. Six or seven months ago, I made a documentary covering the situation at Schalke, at a time in which the club already looked doomed to be relegated. Bremen's relegation was not like Schalke's. They didn't look totally out of their depth, wildly cut adrift at the foot of the legal season, and, but for a touch of fortune, one or two fewer injuries, and some slightly better refereeing decisions, they could well have survived. In that sense, Bremen's relegation was much more akin to their rivals Hamburg just a few years ago, inasmuch as the fact that it came as a shock that the club was relegated, but at the same time there was a feeling of a deeper malaise and long-term decline, and a general sense that if it hadn't been last season, then it would only have happened at some stage over the next few years regardless. Werder Bremen are in 75 million euros of debt. They've already sold Milo Rashitska for between 11 to 14 million euros to Norwich City, and further sales are expected in the coming weeks. Ludwig Augustinsson seems far too good of a fullback to be playing second tier football, and Bremen are already believed to have knocked back bids of 3 million euros. Austrian international Marco Friedel is also likely to attract interest. Meanwhile, Josh Sargent, maybe the club's most valuable asset, reportedly valued by them at 10 million euros. Supporters would love to see club captain Omesh Toprak stay at the club, but his high wages and the large number of centre-backs at the Visa Stadion mean most expect him to depart. Thankfully, for all of their financial mismanagement, Verdar did at least have the foresight to insert 40-60% to wage cuts into every player's contract in the event of relegation, which means that their wage bill has effectively been cut in half before they even look to move the majority of their high earners on. During the off-season, Verdar received a 60 million euro loan from a firm in France, 
which will have to be repaid by 2026. That has delayed the sense of imminent danger at the club, but it is just more debt, failing to address the crux of the problem and effectively kicking the can down the road if more meaningful change isn't implemented, and a change in fortunes not brought about. The first game of the 2021-22 second Bundesliga season has already taken place, and by the time this video comes out, so too will the second. In Verdar's season opener against Hanover, the club drew one all. It was a fairly uninspiring performance in truth, but season openers often are, the weather conditions were pretty poor, and given the fact that Bauman is still talking of a total of 20 transfers in and out of the club before the transfer window slams shut, it's difficult to know how much one can read into it. Werder are the second favourites for promotion from the second Bundesliga this season, behind Schalke, who lost their opening game of the season, 3-1 against Hamburg, and those four teams that I just mentioned tell you all that you need to know about the incredible stature of club competing in this season's second Bundesliga, who will face stiff competition from less illustrious but equally ambitious teams like Heidenheim, Holstein Kiel, and Karlsruhe. There is a previously postponed membership meeting at the Visa Stadion schedule for September, which is likely to see changes abound at boardroom level, and possibly even a change of sporting director. On the only previous occasion in which Werder Bremen were relegated, it prompted immediate introspection, a change of tact, promotion as champions at the first attempt, and a prolonged era of outstanding success. Now they have been relegated again. Marcus Anfang is the man tasked with being Bremen's next Otto Rehagel, but it remains to be seen whether he, and those above him, will be able to turn the Werder Bremen tanker around. Football has changed a lot since Werder's last relegation, over 40 years ago, and so too have Werder themselves. Bremen are known for their patient and passionate fanbase, who rarely turn on players and managers, and have funded the club for so long. Even they turned to scenes of anger when Bremen were relegated last season though, as they were met with tear gas and water cannons at the hand of the local police. Werder may now need more cash than their phenomenal supporters can provide them with, along with a management team, from the boardroom to the backroom, who have a coherent, long-term vision for the club. There is lots of work ahead, but Werder Bremen will be a fascinating team to follow in what promises to be a blockbuster second Bundesliga this season. That is it for today's video, but thank you all very much as ever for watching. Hit the like button if you enjoyed this video, let me know your thoughts down below in the comments, and make sure that you are subscribed and have notifications turned on by just hitting the little bell icon for HITC Sevens. You can also find me on Twitter or on Instagram by the username at HITC Sevens on both, should you wish to do so.